This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. Find all my work at mjmunoz.com. This is Digimon Seekers, and I'm continuing with my audio book recording of Digimon Seekers. This is Digimon Seekers, I mean, this is Digimon Chronicles. This is Digimon Chronicles, where I'm reading Digimon Seekers, making basically an audio book for it. Uh, this is a fan project for free, of course, I'm not charging anybody for it. Uh, today I'm going to be using the translation by... Kun or on Kun, I'm not quite sure how to say that day, but K, I think it's just what matters there, because that's what I've heard. So, anyway, I will be reading that translation. Uh, it was interesting, when I pasted in the notes originally, or the, the script, rather, from the website, uh, originally I had about a 1700 word count, and when I uh, pasted in Kun's, there was about a 1900. Now, I don't know what will be added, and I'm not going to do a head-to-head -head comparison, but I'm thinking that this should be a lot more readable because uh, in the past when I've read his translations, they've been more readable. So let's go ahead and get to this. I anticipate it'll be about a 10 minute read. We shall see as we go through this together. And uh, I want to let you know my previous Seekers episodes are, yeah, my previous episodes where I'm covering Seekers, they have been mostly the stock translations that come straight off the website, off of Digimon Web, but I'm going to do a ongoing podcast on, uh, audio only file that you can go back and look up an update that will have the most current of the whole collection with the translations by Kekun uh, because I think it's just going to be a much better reading experience overall so you can check that out and I think I'll leave a link to that in the show notes so you, people can go back to that anytime they need to. All right so this is continuing chapter one of Digimon Seekers Wolf of the Ninth Avenue. A.G. Wolf of the Ninth Avenue, and this is Chapter 1, Part 13. The cloaked SOC Digimon gazed at Lugamon and A.G. Nagasumi from atop the building roof in Wall Slum as the duo headed to their mapping job. I wasn't told that they'd be mind-linked, the cloaked Digimon spoke up suddenly to somebody who wasn't there. I had been told of it. Also, didn't expect him to suddenly show up with his limits unlocked. The reply came through voice chat. Never mind the new kid, the cloak Digimon said. I wonder if that dog, Lugamon, noticed that I was mind linked too. Well, I can't be sure. The voice of the person on the other end belonged to the SOC interviewer. You asked the demon wolf of the Castle of Nine Wolves to map Ninth Avenue, the cloak Digimon said with some concern. For a test, isn't that way too easy? You're right, the interviewer said. This sort of test wouldn't be semi-A level for the likes of them. I'll be making a few adjustments. The interviewer was up to something. Once Lugamon reached ground level, he headed further underground. It's a shortcut, he assured A.G. They reached an underground station platform. Chug, 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 chug. In front of a bewildered A.G., a wall slum train came to a standstill. A.G. stared out in a daze at the rapidly changing scenery outside the train as he held onto a hanging strap. The slum loop line subway. The interior of the train was very familiar. In fact, it looked similar to, to the Tokyo metro system that he normally used. The only difference was that the passengers on the train were not humans, but Digimon. The subway map had characters on it that A.G. had never seen before. He wasn't able to read any of the advertisements within the train or at the station. What is this? Digimon language? It's forbidden to cause trouble in the subway, Lugamon said matter-of-factly. Forbidden? So no fighting? In a public place, so mind your manners. <clears throat> Sorry. It's a public place, so mind your manners. Saying this, Lugamon laid down, taking up three whole seats to himself. The Digimon around them looked annoyed, but apparently it wasn't a breach of manners. What the heck were considered good manners did Digimon? A.G. had no idea. The subway train passed through a stop every two to three minutes. A.G. was fidgety and restless, partly because he couldn't read the characters on the map, which he found out was called Digicode. I've been thinking about the mind link, he said to Lugamon as a way to distract himself. Is me being in your Digicore similar to, like, a human riding a Digimon? Am I the Chuchumon? Earlier, who was writing the Damemon? Don't compare me to that piece of poop. It's not like that, then? Hmm. Not even close. Where do you think your real body is right now? 
Um, what? Eiji's consciousness was currently within Lugamon's digihor. Since his physical body wasn't there, it must be back at home, leaning against the wall of his loft. That's right, your body fell asleep like that. Your consciousness doesn't return back to your body unless you break the mind link. Huh. Well, that's fine. Whatever. That's fine. By the way, Lugamon, what is it? Since I'm able to touch you now, can I touch your toe beans? Since Lugamon was lying on the seat on his side, his pad, his paw pads were visible. They looked plump and squishy. No. Why do I have to allow what you want? Lugamon said grumpily, showing his teeth. No, huh? The do dog I used to have wouldn't let me touch his toe beans either. I'll kick you out of my digicore if you keep talking about rubbish like that. Also, from what I'm hearing in your stories about that dog of yours... Hmm? He probably didn't think of you as his master. He looked down on you for sure. What? A surge of passengers got off and got on at the next station. Digimon, who boarded the train, reacted in surprise when they saw Eiji. Hey, Lugamon, I feel like all the Digimon are staring at me. Well, it's rare to see a human here. Oh, so this is like if a Digimon hololized, or was hollowized and riding on a train in the real world. No wonder he was attracting all the, this attention. Since it didn't appear likely that he would be harmed, Eiji took the opportunity to take a closer look at his surroundings. The Digimon in the passenger compartment seemed... Uh, to mostly consist of one single type. Almost all of the Digimon here have corrupted data, A.G. observed. They look injured. Most of all slums inhabitants are Digimon that were originally used by humans, Lugamon said matter-of-factly. What? Now that he mentioned it, A.G. could see the majority of the crowd were cyborg types or machine types, which were favored by codecrackers. They're all Digimon that were used by humans and discarded for some reason or another, Lugamon said. They screwed up on the job or were entrusted with security of some company servers and got destroyed from an attack or something. Discarded Digimon. AG was astonished. It was true that Codecrackers used and abandoned Digimon regularly. Although it was not generally known to the public, governments, military, megatech companies, and other important servers and data centers were already using Digimon in their security. Digimon got used up there on the daily. No matter how, how carefully tools are treated, they eventually break. When they fail, they fail. That's how Eiji had felt about it before now. Normally, those Digimon die a dog's death and revert back into Digi-eggs, Lugamon said. But as they survived by slurping up the scrap data that drifted along the outer security wall, they built up houses, villages, and towns. As long as they can hide... Sorry. As long as they can find their way to this place, Digimon who were abandoned by humans can survive. The stray Digimon that gathered together here are what become this sit. Mm. The stray Digimon that gathered together here are what became this city, this slum, a slum known as Wall Slum. I thought humans were pretty tough, but Digimon are strong too. Ag said, impressed by the very life force of the Digimon. This trash heap of a slum is the last paradise for stray Digimon. Some of them may have gotten fed up with humans and drifted away on their own. Others may have wandered here due to some kind of trouble in the digital world beyond the wall. Nowadays, it's not unusual to find Digimon who were born and raised in this slum. Roar! The subway shout out above... Mm -mm. <laughs> the subway shot out above ground. The sound of wheels treading along rails thundered. The red polluted surface of the river beneath the truss bridge was spread out into the distance. A.G. learned from Lugamon that the slum was full of Digimon like Chumon, who were proliferative everywhere. The mutant Damimon and other Digimon who had adapted and evolved to live happily in an environment polluted with garbage data. Do the Digimon here not get along with each other? Chumon and Chuchumon had been fighting over food. The rule of not fighting allowed on the subway. The rule of no fighting allowed on the subway meant when you flipped it that there was plenty of fighting allowed everywhere else. Basically, uh, basically everyone is poor here, and that's the reason for it all. Lugamon said, "Those in the slum can't consistently feed themselves, so fighting is a daily occurrence. There are turf wars and Digimon in each neighborhood who act as its boss, 
Only in this subway, and in the center of the slum, Avenue Zero, is there an unspoken non-combatant agreement. The center of the slum? That must be the blank area on the map that the cloaked Digimon had shown them earlier. Eiji looked out the window. Upstream of the river was a mountain peak at the center of Wall Slum, made hazy by static. I can't see it very well. What kind of place is it? It has the gate that leads to the inside of the security wall. The wall gate, Lugamon responded. Inside the security wall? You mean the deep digital world? This wall slum was, without any doubt, a part of the digital world, but the deep part of it was protected by the wall contained... Mm -mm. But the deep part of it that was protected by the wall contained the original shape of the digital world. It would be an unknown digital world for you humans. The wall gate controls the flow of data into the digital world and prevents unauthorized entry. The train crossed the river and slid back underground. The subway cars went dark for a moment, then flickered, and the lights came back on. A.G. thought a little bit. This wall gate prevents code crackers, us humans, from getting in. That's right. It's not only humans. It's not only humans, Lugamon said. It also includes Digimon who have been used by code crackers and hackers. That's all of the Digimon in the wall slum. Huh? All of the Digimon here? None of the Digimon on this subway were able to return to the digital world. This wall slum has perpetually been affected by real-world data via the network, Lugamon said. Once a Digimon is contaminated by real-world data, it can never return to the digital world. They lose the ability to pass through the gate. On whose authority? The digital world system, which is all I can really say about that. To put it in human terms, our god, so to speak, for the Digimon of Wall Slum, the inside of the wall, is their long-lost home. Lugamon, do you know what's on the other side of the wall? We're getting off here. Lugamon got up from his seat. Eiji had no idea of what route they'd taken, but he heard the announcement say, Next stop, 9th Avenue. 9th Avenue. Eiji's mind switched over into work mode. First, he had to fulfill Ryu Senji's request and pass the SOC entrance exam. So we're mapping the 9th Avenue, Eiji said. I wonder what kind of place it is. Find out when we get there. You sure seem to know a lot about Walslam, Lugamon. Have you lived here before? Lugamon had been stored from the beginning as his child-level stage in the Digimon Linker. Eiji hadn't bothered to ask where Lugamon had been and what he'd done before then. It had never occurred to him that Digimon could have a past. I don't remember. The sudden confession confused Eiji. What? My memory is hazy for, from one point to another. I know that I grew up here in Wall Slum, but I only remember when I was just a brat at child level. Everything else after that is vague. Lugamon said that he knew about the digital world in Wall Slum, but he couldn't remember much about himself. He had no idea who he was here. Is it amnesia? A.G. asks. Seems kind of half-assed, though. Whenever I try to remember, it's like there's a haze around my digicore. Like fog settling down on my memories. Come to think of it, that Choo-Choo... Come to think of it, that Chumon and the others said something of interest, A.G. said. They seemed to know about you, spoke reverently to you, calling you the demon wolf and boss and whatnot. After coming to Wall Slum with you and listening to them, I feel as if my memories are returning little by little, Lugamon said. That's why I said we might find more out when we get there. I get the feeling that there's something at Ninth Avenue, something that's very important to me. And that is the end of that chapter. I had a lot of stumbles and slips there and i do apologize for that i uh i don't know i slept well i'm feeling pretty good i don't know why i'm fumbling on the read but i won't use this i won't edit those out in this episode uh but i also won't use this raw recording uh as my um uh, as my you know solid kakun translated audiobook track so i'm gonna do i guess i'll have to do separate recordings for those and make them sound real good because uh yeah it's it, that, that's not cool <laughs> there were a lot of stumbles in there and like i said it's just uh i don't know i, I want to get this out sooner than later so i'm gonna let it slip with the imperfections and just let it go but i will blame part of the imperfections on the way that this thing is written just 
and I'm not blaming Cake because this is uh, he's got source material to work with, and in the source material they did not put the dialogue tags. Um, and I I guess you're supposed to read it quietly to yourself, which doesn't really make sense. Like as a as a writer, one of the things that they say is that specifically with scripts for movies and such, movies, teleplay, whatever, you should say the dialogue out loud. Out loud. You should say the dialogue out loud to yourself so that you can hear how it sounds when people are actually saying this. Famously, uh, I've heard, I think, Carrie Fisher and Mark Hamill both say in interviews, maybe even Harrison Ford uh, separately, uh, that they would say of George Lucas's script for Star Wars, you can read this stuff, but you can't say it. Uh, I think partly because it sounds a little goofy when you say it, and also because it's just outlandish to say uh you know, whatever it was, I can't remember, uh, not Alderaan, there was another one, Hamill had this line memorized from the sides of the, uh, the audition, where it was this crazy thing about, oh, the security here won't be like this because of that, or whatever, blah, 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 he's, like, arguing with Han in the cockpit of the Falcon, right, and he was saying, uh, like, you know, he had it memorized, and he's like, you can say it, but it's not natural dialogue, it just doesn't work, and, you know, that's not the dialogue that ended up in the movie, so, um, <laughs> <laughs> all that dialogue was saved for the uh, Anakin Padme romance in Attack of the Clones uh, I kid anyway uh, but yeah so I get that depending on what medium you're in you can do things differently and you can skip on dialogue tags in some places and this is something I've talked about before so I'll just keep it brief and just say you can't do that all the time and I'm really frustrated with how this is uh, written and I wonder what the Japanese readers are thinking of this and what their perception of it is and is it something that they're finding frustrating or something difficult to read aloud or is the i mean it's not like real <laughs> i feel so bad these things it's not like real um like cyberpunk uh or cypherpunk even uh people are going to be reading this because it's you know dipping its toe in that genre or whatever uh this is going to be digimon fans who are reading this and either they're so uh, I don't know, bought and sold, bought and paid for. Either they're so into Digimon that they're just going to ignore all of the uh, demerits or deficiencies in this, or they're going to be truthful, like I'm trying to be, and talk about when they don't like certain things in it. And, and hopefully that's what's happening, but I haven't seen any insights into the Japanese discourse on Seekers. Um, I mean, you know... <laughs> It's funny, too. It struck me a little bit like, oh, Lugumon's got semi-amnesia, but it's starting to clear up as he goes on this adventure. Like, oh, this is a, this is a very video game. This is very anime. This is very, you know, standard for the uh, the genre type of trope. And I'm not mad at that, but it did just kind of strike me as funny. And, like, nothing before uh, indicated that his memories were hazy, to me at least. And I agree with, you know, what was stated in the book that there is this sense that you get that he's experienced and that he's reverenced and uh all this stuff and i thought oh that's cool that we've got this guy who who like um you know has respect from people and has experience and partly because of that he doesn't have respect for ag his you know tamer or cracker or whatever you want to call him and like that's a cool dynamic uh and then we find out that you know he's missing his memories but he still has enough confidence and i don't know self-assuredness uh, to still feel that way about AG is kind of odd. Uh, I did, I almost laughed out loud in the middle of doing the, the reading of the recording when uh, Lugamon said, like, that pet dog you had, I know he didn't respect you. That was a hilarious moment. So uh, I do like that. And I'm going to assume this is Kekun's translation, but calling the, uh, the toe pads or whatever beans, you know, bean pads or whatever he called them like i've definitely heard you know people in america refer to them as that on their cats or dogs or whatever and it's you know it's funny um and uh it was just kind of a i don't know it, it's funny but it's also kind of lame i think if you do that uh, which you know i've done it myself so <laughs> i'm i'm not immune to being lame but it's just uh uh it kind of it goes to state of mind for aging it shows kind of what a goofball he is and while he wants to be this code cracker and wants to be serious he's still you know he's still a person that's kind of kind of good okay so moving on to some other stuff first of all there's an ethical question that i want to bring up from before and i hope the <laughs> i hope john Ta i guess it'd be bandai not toei but whatever hopefully nobody comes after me for this 
the other day, or like two or three readings ago, two or three chapters ago, when AG got hollowized and there was all this personal data from him, and he's like, hey, how do you have all this information from me? Uh, Lugamon, I believe, says, are you an idiot? Don't you recognize that the vital bracelet is pulling all that information from you 24-7? AG... I'll just put it this way. AG, who wears his vital bracelet, or his, uh, you know, his dock, his Digimon dock, or whatever it's called, is willingly uh, submitting himself to be scanned, tracked, and traced to some extent by whatever company is behind the Digimon dock, which, I mean, Ryu Senji made it, you know, it's a kind of an open source platform thing. I don't know if their data is encrypted or what, but, like, his data wasn't encrypted unless it's encrypted and it's, like, peer-to-peer, -peer, and Lugamon receives that data, uh, but anyway, regardless, like the device itself, the dock has the ability to pull all this biometric data from you and scan all this information data from you. And that's kind of creepy. And it made me think, oh, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if, uh, Bandai, I guess it's Bandai who makes it right. I wonder if Bandai recognizes that and knows it. And like, if they thought about that and if people who wear the, uh, vital bracelet think about that. And, uh, like I've considered getting, I don't know, one of those things like Armin or, uh, uh, what's the other one? I can't remember what it's called. It's the most popular one. Anyway, I've considered it, and I thought, like, no, isn't that, like, gonna give somebody information on me? And that seems weird and uncomfortable, and, uh, there's a lot of, you know, you should protect your data, basically, is what I'm saying. And, uh, I haven't looked into it, and I'm not making any accusations, but when that was, uh, like, a, an element in the story, I thought, oh, wow, that's, that's super interesting, and I wonder if people are gonna talk about that, or, um, think about that at all, and then I forgot to talk about it, so it didn't happen with me, so, uh, there you go, if you hadn't thought about that, that's something to consider for the future. All right, uh, other thing, this Digimon are alive, which it didn't say that this episode, or this chapter, which is good, but, um, these Digimon are, like, somehow, like, okay, there's this, either this god of the digital world, or this protocol that once a Digimon has left the digital world and gone out beyond that gate, uh, beyond the wall gate, or whatever I think it was called, um, they are not allowed to go in back into the deep or to the actual digital world, or I guess it's the deep digital world. That is super fascinating, super interesting. I like that AG is think I think it man because he says, Hey, why is that the case? Who determined that? You know, who by whose authority he said in K's translation here. And I think that's a great question because what makes that legitimate? It's, you're saying they don't do it or they are unable to do it, and it's clear that they are unable to do it, or at least it sounds as if they're unable to do it. They're definitely not supposed to do it. And the trigger for making the distinction between Digimon is that if they've gone out, I guess it's once you go out, you can't come back in is what it sounds like. It's a much simpler way to put it. Um, and there's either some protocol or some force in play uh, that makes that so. And I find, again, I find that to be super interesting. And like, I don't know why that would be the case, but it is. And I... I wonder what's up with that. So that's kind of a a fun thing to think about. Like that raises all sorts of questions. You know, is there really a god of the digital world? Is there some sort of uh, set of protocols that was put in place that are like I don't know. I don't know. I I know enough about computers to be dangerous, basically, uh, to myself, not so much to others, <laughs> unless they trust me. But like, does that mean like at the base level, at the kernel, at the like in the source code or whatever, there's something that says that once Digimon have left and become their data has been become corrupted by stuff outside of the you know pure pristine digital world that it makes it so that they can no longer come back in is as simple as like their data has changed and uh it no longer retains the proper you know hash function so to speak to enable them to get in like they're rehashed and because they have outside data mixed in with them it, or like salted in with them is to use like security language uh like it doesn't work the hash that they have isn't the same you can have a if you stay in the digital world i mean but you would never have to re-authenticate so that's that's kind of a weird thing like you can go out but you can't come back in so does that mean that there's only somebody on the inside of the gate stopping anybody from coming in or does that mean that there's because why would there be permission to flow out but not to flow back in that kind of doesn't make sense to me. But again, I don't know necessarily enough about computer stuff and I don't know enough about the lore, but it does open up questions and I find it to be very interesting, a uh, very interesting idea to consider. Um, so yeah, that was pretty neat. And I those are my big lore points. Um, you know, I am going to continue to stick with the story just because, uh, you know, you need something to do with life. <laughs> 
and I want to see this story go somewhere. I want to be interesting, but like, I cannot believe that we're 13 parts into one chapter. That doesn't make any sense. And I won't belabor the point because I've already talked about that and how I hope to see it change in the future. So, uh, that's it. I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. And I thank you for your time and attention. This is MJ signing out. I hope you enjoyed that. Go to mjmunoz.com to leave any questions, comments, or other feedback you might have. There you can find all of my analysis, art, and fiction. I cover books, tokusatsu, comic books, anime, and more. Look around. You're sure to find something else that you'll enjoy as well. This has been a Story Over Everything production.